You are listening to Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Dr. Joe Haverman, and I'm here with Echebet Tifra. Is that yes. rightly pronounced? Yes. Okay. Um, welcome, Echebet. I'm really happy that we finally get to record this episode and have our listeners um, be able to participate in some of our, our brainstorming conversations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Joe. And uh, I think I um, need to say hello to Joe's dog as well. Uh, sitting in the in the Zoom setting, we all need more dogs to our lives. Uh, but so thanks a lot for uh, having me today uh, in your podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, listeners, you might hear some growling or whining from a little <laughs> lap dog. <laughs> Oh, there's also the I dog open science hashtag, which is worthwhile to look up. Um, so hashtag I dog D O G open science, and then you will see some of the dogs in the open science uh, community. So um, we met a couple of years ago, so we've we've spent some time together also in this open science community, um, and. I, I tend to introduce open science as nothing special. It's really nothing new. Um, it's in in my understanding, and I think we probably also share that, is that it's good scientific practice. And the difficulty now that we why we need to talk about it, and where good scientific practice has ha, has been not neglected, but it's difficult to comply, is through the digital age and the the variety and the the high number of digital tools that have come to play. There's also many pressure points in the academic system we will talk about, which also gave rise to the, um, what some refer as the open science movement. And yeah, and open science is like, to me, it's like organic food. It's a label for something that should naturally be in place and be a practice. And now we talk about it in a digital era, in my understanding. What's your take on open science? What does open science mean to you, Achebet? Yes, uh, I very much like your metaphor of, um, of open science is like uh, organic food. Another dear colleague, uh, a Berlin colleague of mine, uh, uh, Naomi Truan, the linguist, uh, also compared the other day open science to veganism in the sense of uh, uh, you can adopt, you can check what's working for your mind, for, for your practices, for your life situation step by step. Um, for me, um, like metaphors are especially dear because um, you may know that um, I'm coming from a background in linguistics where I've been studying how metaphors shape our um, cultural concepts, cultural mm -hmm. discourses. And so um, I think I'm safe to say that for me, the whole uh, revelation towards open access and open science started with um, corpus linguistics textbooks and some illegal photocopies of them. <laughs> but so very concretely, uh, I think, um, limitations to limitations in access to knowledge um, have always been something very tangible throughout my studies mm. so i remember episodes when um we had international items on our reading lists and the lecturer said that okay uh, go to google books and try to read as much as uh, is available from this book don't worry about the the uh, censored pages or other episodes where the institutional librarians sent ar around emails saying that, oh, okay, good news. Um, we have a free trial access to this and this scholarly database, Scopus or whatever. So please, everybody, just use it for your best and download as many things as you can. Um, and later on during my PhD, um, so visiting libraries, um, like university libraries in foreign countries to get access to the latest findings, the latest literature was very much a community practice. So you can imagine it like uh, 
once we got a scholarship, for instance, to Berlin uh, through DRD, um, we sit together and we uh, put together a list. So please, for me, bring home this and this and these records. And for me, please uh, make a copy of this and this and these book chapters. So basically, back then we had to cross physical borders to overcome virtual ones, yeah. such as paywall. Um, it's pretty bizarre if you think about it. And then it was about, so for me, having open access to publications uh, was, has always been a kind of a no brainer. Nobody had to explain the significance of this to me, but also later it became clear that, um, okay, having open access to tradi these traditional research outputs like book chapters, like journals, and the like is important, but it will not fully solve the problem. We need to go beyond papers. And um, it was also during my PhD, the first time like we, you know, we were at the stage of uh, making international connections, um, research wise, first time in our, in our lives. And uh, in one of these conferences, I heard about um, a tool, a discourse analysis, text analysis tool called MaxQDA. And uh, I was amazed by the magic it, 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 it did. And, um, and uh, I found it super useful. And my colleagues were generous enough to share their uh, work within this analysis tool. They shared their markups, their text annotations, and I could bring it home. And it was quite a disappointment upon my return, uh, trying to open the content, trying to open the closed format of a closed proprietary system uh, in my environment. And it was um, completely no option uh, that my institution would buy a license for me to this um, uh, proprietary MaxQDS software. So um, these questions of, can I, run your data on my tool? Can I make sense of it in my own research environment and vice versa uh, became also apparent, I would say. So in this sense for me, open science is both something very global and something really individual. Mm -hmm. So on the macro level, I would say it's about uh, better connecting researchers and research projects from geographical regions, from disciplines, enabling scholars globally to, to access, to deposit, to analyze resources beyond borders and disciplines, regardless of their affiliation, regardless of their nationality, regardless of one's institutional budget. And the beautiful thing is that on the level of individuals on this, on this micro level, um, it's about the ability to look over your colleagues' shoulders and to better understand and, and follow what they are doing, the, to follow the whole process step by step. And um, what is important is that as individuals, we have a lot of power to revisit and change our practices in this respect to make them more transparent, make them more accessible. Uh, you can think about blogging as a publication. You can think about writing up methodological notes as a publication, updating your GitHub repository as a publication. So there are always options, um, which are eventually always a combination of something closed and something open. Mm -hmm. uh, but so there are small steps everybody's is that are at everybody's disposal um, using social media openly commenting on each other's work uh, properly naming the variables in the statistics these are small practices like uh, from starting a conversation on social media or even just properly, properly labeling uh, your variables in, a, in a statistics and, and small things like that, but uh, that, that are at the disposal for each and every one of us. But the further we get from the desk of a scholar um, or this desk of a research group reaching institutional scales, national scales, European global scale, the more complicated it gets. And 
questions like equity and participation in research, these are big issues that are deeply embedded and, and even deeply affected by their actual political realities and current issues. And I think the big question that keeps all of our minds busy these days, of course, is um, how these political realities change participation, for instance, for Ukrainian scholars, but also how it affects Russian academics who stood up against the aggression. So how deeply vulnerable academia becomes during wartime and what are the sources of resilience in this respect. So um, the work that you are also doing, Joe, um, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, help the situation, but also initiatives. Um, I think you've already mentioned the Science for Ukraine initiative in your podcast. It's a community group of volunteers, um, researchers, students, from academic institutions in Europe to collect and disseminate information about support op opportunities uh, for Ukrainian scholars. But there is also another initiative that um, uh, I'm following and, and, and uh, contributing to a little bit. It's uh, Saving Ukrainian Culture Heritage Online. It's not only arts and humanities scholars and digital humanists mainly, but also cultural heritage professionals, librarians, archivists, who are working together to archive digital collections, digital museum uh, archival collections from Ukrainian institutions while the country is under attack. So these are super important contributions um, that you know, also have to do a lot. Oh, sorry. It, um, it's a, I, yeah. yeah. I just want to ask um, the Saving Cultural Heritage in Ukraine, could you share a few of the activities that are being proposed or what people can do online to help secure cultural heritage? Oh, yes. Uh, so basically, I see uh, two main um, lines of, of, of this very important work. Uh, one, of course, is on site. and. Um, I will send you the link uh, to the super important work uh, that is done by my colleagues at the Lives, Lviv Center of uh, Urban Studies. Um, basically, uh, before the war, uh, they have been providing uh, digitizations, also including, if I remember correctly, 3D digitizations that are modeling the city of uh, Lviv in uh, different historical periods. and. Uh, now they went uh, full capacities uh, archiving the, 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 the ongoing disaster, I would say. And also in parallel, they are providing on-site shelter to the refugees within these institutions. So you can imagine the situation of one day uh, you shift from modeling the middle-aged city model of Lviv to, to offering beds for people fleeing from the eastern parts of the country and doing the contemporary documentation of the war in parallel. So that's a very important line of work. And um, this other initiative is that I mentioned, this SUHO initiative, Saving Ukrainian Culture Heritage Online, um, has to do mainly with web archiving. So they are um, they are taking care of, uh, they are making sure the, the longevity, the long-term archiving of the already digitized culture heritage materials that are already available on the web, but, but we don't know how long they will remain openly available on the web. That's a global initiative, mainly um, um, originated from my colleagues in the US. Um, so it means that, of course, um, language competency is always a big plus, but scholars from across the world and cultural professionals alike um, can globally participate in this saving action. Yeah, that's good to know. We will share these links also on the show notes or in an affiliated blog post to this episode. Um, yes. And so beyond this, but not completely independent from this, um, I think um, 
there is this crucial question of whether open science will solve st the structural inequalities in knowledge production. And so somewhat paradoxically, as open science is getting more recognized and established and uh, embedded in policy and funder mandates, so it's becoming really the mainstream. And parallel to this, we yet began to understand what can go wrong. Uh, or potentially what went wrong already in its implementation. So a colleague of ours, I think uh, he will uh, also be sooner or later guests of your podcast, wonderful podcast series, Joe, uh, Tony Ross Hellower and his team just published a great deal of very spot on insights on how open science could became just, could become just a, the, the extension of such privileges. And this is something that, um, that is very visible in my everyday open science advocacy practices as well. For instance, when it comes to open access publication fees, um, of course, um, richer institutions are more in the position to pay such fees. Um, an established tenured professor is more in a position to publish their book open access or research teams with uh, solid external funding will have more time and effort to prepare data for open dissemination um, by contrast to somebody who needs to take extra job on top of their salaries to make ends meet. So it's really just a question of uh, privileges and capacity sometimes. And I think this drives our attention to towards the complexities and it suggests that these simplistic blanket solutions will not work when it comes to making open science uh, a mainstream modus operandi within and outside academia. And um, the more I spend, the more time I spend with advocacy and helping research teams, the more I believe that along the same line, epistemic cultures also really matter. So when you engage in conversations about open access and, and open research practices, um, it's very interesting to see how, for instance, publishing means very, very different things to each and every one of these uh, research teams and, and disciplinary communities. And, these differences translate into very different needs. And honestly, this is something I truly love in, um, in, in um, connecting scholars with the ideas of open science. But this is, on the other hand, is also something truly challenging. So on the bottom line, I think uh, we cannot make this message loud enough that open science will not truly open until it's um, equally inclusive with, with all the disciplines, all the knowledge areas and, and all the geographical regions as well. Well, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I also agree with Tony's paper, which we also will link to in our show notes and the blog post, um, that there is this misconception now when I ask early career researchers what if they already know about open access, they nowadays, since two, three years, they say, yes, of course, we've heard a lot. And then the next sentence is, oh, but it's very expensive. We can't afford this or the library pays for it. It's like, but, but that's not the point. This is not what open access is about. Yes, there's a few stakeholders, a few of the publishers and journals um, that take advantage of it and try to rent this um, article processing fees. But that's not what open access means. Primarily, as you as you um, explained, it's about well, not so what the word says, making research outcomes publicly available, which they ought to be. And yes, there is fees involved, but the fees are certainly not in the thousands of euros or dollars. And and then there's also other barriers that um, Tony and colleagues pointed out, which you touched upon, and. And you also now led the direction towards what are the limitations of, of open, open science? So where, oh, this is also one of the major fears is to, yes, it's nice to have everything open, but many researchers feel isn't also 
on and also probably rightly argue there's a, also a responsibility by researchers to make sure that the information is curated well before it goes public. And that's also a misconception that I often experience when I advocate for open science in my courses and conversations. Open science doesn't necessarily mean that you put everything, like that you that you publish the whole workflow one by one. It's like, but it asks for a thoughtful um, consideration, planning, documentation, and that then should be publicly available. And yes, mm -hmm. there is sensitive data in all disciplines. And medicine is the most well, well known example with um, patients' data, but there's many other sensitive data and also in social sciences with interviewees. And of course, you don't want to public any private information about um, research participants. Um, well, so, so would, would this be something to talk about for a few minutes the limitations of open science and the misconceptions? where people often have understandable fears to, to embrace open science because then they fear they make themselves vulnerable or they might also cause harm by making unsolicited or uncurated information publicly available. Mm, I think one of the, one of the biggest um, reservations against open science um, that I encounter in my daily job is whether open science is, is at, to what extent open science is relevant to the communities, the specific disciplinary communities that I'm serving, like arts and humanities, or we are serving at Daria Arts and Humanities scholars. Mm -hmm. So the big question here is how much science is in open science. And <laughs> if you look at the, the dominant impact of science engineering, uh, uh, technical, uh, uh, techniques, mathematics fields on, on the big open science agendas and also on the practices, then I think the answer is obvious, mm -hmm. quite a lot. There is quite a lot of science in open science. And um, working in arts and humanities fields, we do not feel, do not always feel addressed by these general keywords like, you know, reproducibility or the publication of no results or pre-registration, but we are wondering instead like, okay, where are my books from this, from this story? Uh, what if I don't generate my data, but instead collect them from the library and I don't have full control over it? Uh, how can I openly share it while the ownership over it is not mine, but is shared between the, uh, the, the, the subject on the image and the producer of the image and the cultural institution who is taking custody of that photograph? So, or other questions like what if statistical reproducibility does not make any sense in my research because I work with qualitative methods or what if I'm working in a language other than English mm -hmm. or working in a small discipline and therefore my citation impact will never be comparable to that of a physician or how can I guarantee the equal representation of smaller cultures who will reward the efforts of upscaling, for instance, NLP tools to different languages, other resource languages. So um, for me, um, of course, as I told you before, open science, open access, and the whole idea and then the principles underlying um, became really game changers very early on. But um, I still remember very well these initial frustrations that I came across. And the more I learned about what we call the open research culture, the more confused I became about mm -hmm. how my own research fits into this. And the more uh, I learned about it, the more I wanted to change this. And luckily, then I was um, fortunate enough to meet people who, uh, who, who were puzzling by the same frustrations. And I, I just realized that uh, I'm not alone with these concerns. And, uh, and, uh, and we could start a discussion and, and the support and, and the encouragement I received from from that these communities from these conversations were strong enough to start seeking ways in which I could merge these two 
uh, home of, of, my, of, of my scholarship like humanities and, and open science and, and, um, and start supporting open, like start learning about and supporting open research practices that are organically growing out from, from arts and humanities. And you mentioned open access and the discussion about open access and publication fees. I find it super important to highlight that, um, that um, there are some innovations, there are some solid contributions to open research, open access that come from humanities and what we call the diamond open access publication models is, is clearly one of them. It's um, basically the idea and the model of where researchers can openly access publications and authors can publish without publication fees. Um, and so in arts and humanities fields where there is not a huge amount of you know, external grant money is going around and people are publishing as part of their daily jobs, as part of their salaries, paying article processing charges or even super, super high book processing charges will never really become a reality on a large scale. So uh, diamond open access models where um, um, libraries team up or institutions team up to co-found co -found, um, open access publishing infrastructure directly is um, a response to that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but um, um, you were asking about um, limitations of open access and finding a good balance between the open end and between a, between a closed. Mm, I think that in many cases, um, like, scholars from these arts and humanities fields are already practicing and, and, and even fostering, uh, I would say, genuine open science without explicitly calling it as uh -huh. such. So, you know, there is this, this myth of the lonely author uh, who is working alone, but if you think about it, knowledge is very, very rarely, if ever, had been produced by individual human beings, like individuals only. And in reality, we routinely build on each other's work. Uh, we, we build on each other's resources. We analyze text corpora created by others. We interlink collections of artifacts to establish hidden connections between them or enrich them or uh, use scholarly databases for discovery. And so this has been recognized uh, by humanists too along the advent of uh, digital technologies and research. So from the, it's, it's, a, it's a discussion from the 2010s on and, um, and humanists like the philologist Gregory Crane uh, are really uh, influential in this respect. Um, so there is, a, there is a discussion on that and, and um, so I mentioned that there are tools available, there are solutions available that are not uh, necessarily explicitly open science branded, but uh, are naturally emerging from doing collaborative research digitally, I would say. So, um, and these solutions usually reflect on limitations uh, infrastructural limitations or legal ethical limitations, for instance, um, you must have heard about um, the initiative uh, abbreviated like IIIF, the mm -hmm. uh, image interoperability framework. This is a um, both um, a guidelines, set of communities, set of guidelines, set of um, collection of good practices, but also a collection of uh, tools and, and, and solid infrastructure and know-how to enable arts and humanities scholars to embed images to their publications or to their working environment directly from um, the cultural heritage institutions along um, clarified reuse conditions, along mm -hmm. clear licensing information, along clear protocols also in terms of technicalities. So many of these are uh, 
brilliant examples of how limitations and um, epistemic specificities can actually sparkle innovations if, if, if scholarly communities um, join forces and, and address those challenges in more depth. Mm. Yeah, so you mentioned quite a few legal aspects with which many researchers feel like a pest. <laughs> I can put myself <laughs> on that. But I can also assure your listeners, um, it's actually not so complicated as it might seem. And also, as, as you pointed out, actually, but like these legal aspects to consider is also to secure ownership, to to shift ownership where necessary um, to for the image creators or painters or whatever owns the copyright to uh, a digital or a paper-based work or a text or data set um, that as researchers are then allowed to model it and to repurpose it and then also our results to be able to repurpose so that's Creative Commons licenses, which have been popularized, but there's also more traditional license types, um, which are still at play. And it's really not so difficult. It's just a matter of reading up what each license type implies. And, um, and well, how, well, it can I be would, difficult. I, I agree. <laughs> I okay. would, I would, I would, I would challenge this. Uh, I would challenge this uh, this idea of of um, Creative Commons is a solution that that our solution because uh, creative like it's a whole licensing family uh, yeah. that solve all our problems in this respect um, also because what I see many cases in, in supporting scholars uh, in, in openly sharing their work is that in many cases these legal challenges are not only legal challenges but they are coming from they're coming with a whole complex package of infrastructural, ethical, technical, conceptual implications. Mm -hmm. So it can get super complex. I mentioned that, um, so one of the, like, you know, one question that um, I was wondering before starting this job at Doria that I'm going to talk about is, um, hopefully, is, um, there are so many diverse disciplines belonging under this umbrella term of arts and humanities, musicologists, historians, literature scholars, uh, fashion designers, uh, what like NLP specialists, what have you, and whether we can talk about shared challenges at all when it comes to their data workflows. And one such shared challenges that I previously mentioned is that most cases, these data workflows start uh, originate from outside of the institutions, outside of, uh, of, of what would be a hypothetical research lab. Humanists are not generating their data, but they are collecting. Um, and, and cultural heritage institutions has and, uh, are a natural partner and, and, and a natural starting point for that. So. Um, just telling you an example of, of such complexities, um, one of the first practical challenges I, I had to came across when, and started this uh, open humanities job is, uh, was a case of um, a publication, an archival uh, resource guide, um, like um, it, it was uh, written on the topic of First World War and First World War cultural heritage. And what happened is that just before the publication, uh, the research team received um, an email checkup from the publisher asking them, okay, so um, before we send this uh, material to the print, um, how about the license of these images? And um, so even after very thorough, very repeated checks and uh, research, uh, they were not able to find the reuse information to all the images and eventually they had to leave a significant portion of them out of publication. Mm -hmm. And I think this is clearly the worst that could happen to 
culture and cultural materials and research materials for that matter too, is that due to these reasons, they became invisible from the cultural discourses, from the scholarly discourses. And, um, you know, especially materials who are likely to be under copyright, like uh, early 20th century materials and 20th century materials in general, um, they are super exposed to that. There are topics, there are authors, there are heritages that nobody really dares or wants to touch and investigate clearly because, not because they are under copyright in many cases, but because the copyright holder is unknown. Mm. So this is really, I would say, distortious. And this is super something super important to keep in mind that the state, like, in this respect, arts and humanities research is super dependent on digitization and the open availability of, of these digitized collections. And it will affect their working conditions because we really cannot expect in the foreseeable future that each and every cultural artifact will be digitized. And maintaining this watchful awareness towards uh, this this um, epistemic marking, this this asymmetry or this inequalities in the availability of cultural materials, is is really something really important because um, there is a great deal of topics, authors, materials that are really sunken behind this what I call this digital horizon. Um, my uh, so this we, we we really need to remember of what is invisible from digital um, mm. discovery systems, for instance. Yeah, I totally agree. Also, I want to apologize. I didn't want to um, come across <laughs> as simplifying the legal aspects. I, I come from a bioscience background where things are very repetitive and it's, I, I, would, I would argue it's maybe not as complex legally as it is in the social sciences and arts and humanities. And along images you, you explained, how the complexity kind of evolves and, and where it comes from and copyright um, ownership of data. Like it's a constant struggle and, um, and questioning and shifting also in the biosciences. Actually, I just, with, with my statement earlier, I just wanted to take away some of the fear to, for, to encourage as early career researchers to look into the legal aspects of their work because it is important and it does matter. And it also empowers researchers to take ownership of the project and to assess ownership of each component that contributes to a research project. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. And you know, Joe, what I, what, what I find particular in this respect is that it's, it's said, of course, this is something said easier than done like, uh, uh, I think the cru there, there are crucial twists in, in research workflows if you are working with sharing in mind. If you, you mentioned interviews, so if you work with human subjects as in subjects as interview subjects, when designing your consent form, you need to have an idea already at that point what you're gonna do with those interview transcripts, whether you want to share them somewhere. Uh, whether you want, whether you need to anonymize them, there is GDPR, but also whether if you put them, if you share them in a repository, whether that repository will be harvested by bigger European discovery frameworks as well, like the European Open Science Cloud. So there are a whole range of tweaks and twists that you need mm. to think ahead when, when uh, working with sharing in mind, for instance, at Doria, we, um, for instance, give a checklist to people working with cultural heritage material before the, your first visit to the archive, digital or physical, here are the things that you might want to ask from your archivist in order to be able to share your data five years later, 10 years later, two years later, whatever. Mm. But um, these challenges, as I already mentioned, I rarely ever only legal and cultural ones, but there is this frequently voiced concerns in open science discourses that open science seems at risk when it relies on closed and proprietary systems. And 
yet the open infrastructures or, or contributions to open infrastructures uh, are often based on voluntary work, voluntary labor, not properly rewarded. Um, there is no difference in, in working with cultural heritage in this respect. So um, just last week, I came across very sad news of Flickr and Internet Archive have deleted a um, very significant collection of um, um, 5.2 million uh, digitized books and book illustrations, the Internet Archive book images collections. This collection covered just some, you know, uh, 500 years of print culture. Mm. So of course it was it was uh, used by so lots of uh, historians, artists, researchers, many others. They are embedded these pictures to their collections. Uh, they reused them. They uh, brought them to their own. Um, uh, research environments and the like and reach them but uh, like added um, additional description and additional yeah. information to them and so without any warming it's just disappeared millions of these searchable images just you know became wiped away so so infrastructure the public ownership and and i would say even possibly control over the infrastructure that is instrumental uh, for our research workflows, this is this is another challenge in implementing open science. I would say. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. It's it's we really need to build system, and I think the understanding is there from from many stakeholders, especially those of us who consider um, building a connected, globally connected, interoperable, sustainable research infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a diverse discussion to have. And because like what, what I also learned with Africa Archive and naturally um, infrastructure has been built in silos out of needs for specific communities. And we're not trying to plug them together and it's not as easy as like with our sockets like there's american sockets there's uk sockets there's central european ones so we need all kinds of adapters <laughs> okay but but in terms of sustainability um and functionality like how can we preserve scholarly literature scholarly knowledge not only literature but also artifacts and and images and the cultural and scholarly heritage um so we're using repositories some sort and then for licensing or copyright reasons they might just like, like you just said they might just disappear again overnight and then the question is who makes those decisions mm -hmm. to deprive now the researchers and the cultural custodians of the content overnight mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the problem like who, regarding who makes these decisions, this is of course in many cases and especially uh, coming back to the Internet Archive um, has to do with negotiations around two conflicting or seemingly conflicting interests being uh, mm -hmm. copyright and protecting uh, copyrights, one's copyrights, one's royalties, whatever. Uh, associated benefits versus opening up uh, the content for, for the public. And these might be conflicting sometimes. These There might be, there are certainly conflicting interests, mainly I don't want to put too much emphasis on this somewhat commonsensical uh, blaming publishers, but in many cases, this is indeed the publishers who are pushing for uh, for uh, compliance with, with, with copyright mandates and the like, and then uh, trying to save their own interests. But so in many cases, I think it takes us back to the issue of designing infrastructures, designing resources with sharing in mind. That said, um, if one knows in advance how exactly they want to share that content, how exactly they want to make it available for a smaller community or a broader one, um, there are lots of legal, ethical, social, technical elements that have to be sorted out 
Netherlands. And um, Joe, I will come back to your socket metaphor a little bit later. So, so I, I will try to keep this in mind, not only because um, because you may know how 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 dear metaphors are for to me, but also because Daria has to do a lot with, with socketing and I will tell you about it in a second. But I think in order to um, talk about infrastructures and why we need infrastructures and how optimally design infrastructures in the context of my own daily job at Daria, I need to um, come back also to this basic recognition of open science that we are not producing only papers anymore right yeah. so the question is how to sustain these new types of digital scholarly objects like the software um the annotation layers um the, 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 the data whatever we mean by the term data uh, all the other resources so how we can sustain them because libraries even digital libraries are are increasingly challenged by preserving them mm -hmm. and how we can you also mentioned silos so how we can connect them in a publicly maintained environment and and, and in meaningful ways that's i think the big question that um, not only daria but also other research infrastructures are aiming to answer and aiming to tackle and just to tell you a bit of a um, history about it i think um it was around um, 20 like the, the the 2010s when um institutions on the national level recognized this kind of challenge increasingly like research institutions and they realized that they need to make collective investments into such services such research infrastructures that they as institutions individually or even nationally could not maintain or could not have maintained alone. And this was a good timing because the same time this need for long-term planning and, and making this infrastructural investments for, for research also been recognized by the European Commission. Mm -hmm. And this gave rise to what we call ERICS, European Research Infrastructure Consortia, which is a special form of establishment, form of organization that is uh, organized along disciplines. So all main disciplines have one ERIC in Europe. And uh, so uh, they connect European research organizations and, and scholars and scholarly networks um, on a disciplinary basis to make such collective investments into research infrastructure together. So my organization, Daria, became such an Eric in, I think, 2014. Yes. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. <laughs> well, but that's, that's great to know that there's organizations and, and people taking charge of that and making sure that there's a, an efficient, also financially efficient approach to connecting mm -hmm. those silos with each other to not only preserve scholarly knowledge and cultural mm -hmm. heritage, but also make it accessible and reusable. Mm -hmm. in the sense of fair, I think for what you described, like how humanitarian, no, humanities, mm -hmm. research items um, as a collective term are being reused to investigate, to, to study cultural legacies. Um, mm -hmm. Society, art, cultures, yeah. art, mm -hmm. arts, music, makes sense. I feel in the natural sciences we're slowly but surely losing grip. <laughs> we're producing data, and who has the time to actually mm -hmm. look through all this knowledge production that we're currently producing, and also what it's worth unless it's properly contextualized. Is there a similar? Oh issues also in the in the social and humanitarian hum, social sciences and humanities mm. yeah absolutely i think context is a is a is a key uh, element here and also a key organizing principle and added value along connecting these different um, institutional silos or or like uh, infrastructural components absolutely so um 
um, that's that's um, that's that's a very important notion for for Daria as well. And just to tell you um, an example, one of the one of the latest and, and very important long awaited services that uh, we have been co-developed with other organizations and sister research infrastructures is um, um, is something called the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud. And it's open cloud, not only because open, it's, it's um, a commitment to open science, open humanities, open social sciences, and, um, and the cloud-based like web service, but also because um, um, it's gonna be a very important part of, um, of social sciences and humanities resources within what we call the European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was a question of how to meaningfully bring a whole different research domain of social sciences and humanities who are internally very complex and very diverse to this big European open science cloud. And um, at Daria, um, we really didn't want to, it, so don't get me wrong, it's not the job of Daria to reproduce all the facilities, all the um, data repositories, all the culture heritage digitized collections, all the text analysis tools, all the image interoperability frameworks, whatever researchers are working with uh, on the European level. But instead, Daria's role is to, um, to develop a consolidated view of what is available, not only next door on campus, but also on a little bit broader level, mm -hmm. uh, what is available across the, the Daria member countries. It's, it's currently 20 countries and a couple of hundreds of institutions. So, you know, we have lots of lots of treasures and, and tools, services, training materials, data repositories that might be relevant beyond the institutional, beyond the national um, scope. And the question was how to meaningfully bring to these diverse resources together. And we realized also learning from the mistake of earlier attempts to that, that, you know, providing the list that these are the lists uh, you use for, these are the tools you use for text analysis. These are the tools you use for annotation. These are the tools you use for data visualization. Uh, that is probably not the best solution to proceed. So instead we um, decided to go for a kind of a marketplace approach. So the output became a um, discovery service, especially for social sciences and humanities. This is the social sciences and humanities open marketplace where um, yes, scholars can look for tools and services and data and publications and training materials according to their research questions, uh, according to their disciplines. But what really glues them together is that um, if you try to embed those instances and connect them in the context of workflows, research workflows, publishing, um, you know, procedures, research procedures, step by step. So if I want to um, do, um, for instance, comparative analysis of parliamentary corpora, then here is step one, here, is, uh, the re here are the resources that are worth to consult when, they, when in the data collection phase, here are the analysis tools, um, here you can validate your uh, tagging, la la la. So, um, in the context of workflows, um, the connections, the internal assessments, um, the potentials of these resources, the reusability potentials, I think are becoming much more clear. And um, as part of this work, we also did, uh, they also did, the developers of the marketplace, a bit of a work on, for instance, extracting. Um, references to research tools from publications or data, you know, like, um, like um, what we see, and this might be the case for hard sciences as well, but maybe not that much as it is the case in the humanities that um, providing proper 
machine readable, recognizable citations for research tools, software, data sets, it's not yet a community practice. So the developers of this marketplace did a little bit of a work on uh, automatically extracting and cross-referencing uh, tools and papers to see not only what is available, but also how those resources are used in actual research. Thanks for this overview. It's really fascinating and also promising that, mm -hmm. yeah, and also there is a call for we need to foster um, more holistic culture also for the researchers awareness to, yeah, to think about archiving, to think about um, curation mm -hmm. of the data. And I think like um, various stakeholders can also assist the researchers to do that better than mm -hmm. what has historically grown as a practice. Mm -hmm. So also ex ex explicitly, this is not to blame anyone or ourselves and how we do our research as PhD students or <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we. I mean, it's a matter of being informed and being aware of what, how to best contextualize, like to add as much context to any data point, be it a manuscript or an actual data set, interview, like it, it needs to be contextualized irrespective of the discipline or the research topic. Mm. And then to decide what infrastructure, what accessible and available infrastructure to utilize um, for long-term storage and also to yeah accessibility to provide accessibility to the to the knowledge produced. Um, so yeah, these are these are questions that also like I'm I'm learning by the day new things. So at the moment when you think oh no I, I have a pretty good overview and then another thing comes around <laughs> it's like oh, <laughs> one new level of complexity. But that's, that's also fascinating and I feel it's a little bit like being a researcher still. <laughs> like you learn more and then you realize, oh, there's still more to explore and to know and to be aware of. But yeah, but if you if we look at it pragmatically and if we want to support the researchers, how can how can service providers like myself, mm -hmm. trainers, and also um, institutions like the area, what, what are you doing? in making the researchers' lives easy and also efficient for, yeah, for, for data or research knowledge, accessibility and storage? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's, that's a very good question, a beautiful one. And I can resonate with your experience, uh, Joe, because um, when I first, um, when I started acquainting myself with the practices of open access, open science, open research culture, it seemed so easy, even sometimes in the context of my own research, you know, and the more experience I gained providing support, uh, the more I think the opposite, actually. And I can only repeat myself saying that epistemic so if i if i learned like at daria i'm super lucky because you know if you're a linguist you're working in a certain field a certain subfield of that subfield of that subfield and you by the end of your career my you might become competent in that subfield or even field but um, at daria since we are serving um all the arts and humanities disciplines. So there's a wonderful richness here. Uh, I have the chance to work together with very diverse communities who are coming with very diverse needs, um, workflows that are completely digital and large scale and computational versus uh, almost fully analog workflows. Um, dissertations, big horizon projects, and anything and everything in between in terms of scale. So there's a huge diversity here, and I'm learning a lot. And in terms of how best to, to serve scholars, it's super important to, to stay on the ground um, of research realities. And um, so I think um, if you imagine Daria as an organization, like an, this European pan-European organization who provides all kinds of 
um, research and teaching support for the arts and humanities disciplines and connects several hundreds of scholars and research facilities and tools in, in 20 European countries and cooperating partners now. I think um, facilitating to open, open access to resources has always been in the DNA of Daria to, to make scholars' life a little bit easier. So this thought of, so if you think of open science as a kind of engine of scholarly innovation, then the synergies with Daria is quite obvious. Open science had been implicitly there from the beginning, but um, at some point, especially uh, upon watching this um, epistemic differences around open access, open science, and how much the whole paradigm had been dominated by hard sciences, life sciences, biomed sciences, um, I think at some point it became important for Daria as well to, to go explicit and to build an open ag agenda for arts and humanities scholars that is firmly grounded in disciplinary realities. So I, uh, so, and, and, and I became the one who, as uh, Daria's open science officer, uh, it's, it's part of my, my job to to support the implementation of, of, of such, a, such an agenda, such a strategy. So what do we do in practical terms? Um, explicit open sciencing alongside the implicit ones, connecting services, connecting networks, connecting scholars with similar interests. So we found it super important to strengthen the discourse uh, around community practices in open humanities and, um, and Talk, this, talk about disciplinary challenges, talk about shared needs, talk about success stories, disaster stories, people who uh, published their books open access and still survived, people who uh, shared their data and, and they made a difference in their disciplines in this respect, people who uh, implemented open peer review within their own disciplinary contexts, conferences. So it's important to, to um, to organize to, to to foster the discourse around them uh, around these issues and uh, and see how we can bridge open science and humanities um, disciplinary reality. So uh, we have this blog called Daria Open, that is um, that is a dedicated discourse for that. And um, what is also I think super important is that if the idea is to stay really grounded in disciplinary realities, then it's also obvious that this is something that this is a kind of work that we cannot do alone. And luckily, we are not alone in this. But so what I'm saying is that it's super important to have diverse communities around Daria, not beyond the national Darias, to have um, communities who contribute to and, and enrich and validate our work and spread the word about it. And one of these very precious communities uh, whom we have at Daria is um, around the Open Methods platform. It's a platform that brings together open access content, all kinds of content about digital humanities tools and methods specifically. But it can be a video tutorial, it can be a blog post, it can be a preprint, of course, it can be a peer reviewed article as well, it can be um, a podcast for that matter, anything, the media uh, doesn't make any difference, we want to include content that is also out of the site, you know, for this formal established research assessment. And um, now, um, and, and, and we provide a kind of um, um, little discussion around like uh, digital humanities tools and methods in multiple languages because um, multilingualism is an important mm. um, value in this research. So not everything that counts, not all the knowledge that counts had been written in English, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the, this was our favorite topic and also painfully under underserved, under mm -hmm. um, communicated in the scholarly 
community as a whole, but luckily, or yeah, it's, it's good to see that there is now an increasing uh, number of initiatives popping up. And uh, it's, it's also very much uplifting to see that Area is doing so much work or are doing um, quite some effort in fostering multilingualism and probably also naturally because it's yeah it's serving several countries in Europe or each which mm -hmm. comes with their own language and cultural cultural history. Absolutely, absolutely. I will tell you about it in a bit. So yes, but coming back to this open methods um, platform slash community. So uh, imagine twenty, I think twenty eight, twenty nine digital humanities experts who are forming the, from all around the globe, from Argentina, um, from Eastern Europe, uh, US, Western Europe, who are coming from 12 countries and speaking together 20 languages and are able to read and, and curate content in, in 20 languages. It's pretty incredible and, and something really precious, I would say. Um, I really enjoy uh, working with them, but, in addition to the open methods team, um, later we also realized, speaking of, you know, data sharing as I think also in humanities, the, the discourse on open access became established, much more established than other elements of the open research culture. Um, there was some discussion on open peer review, but um, the discussions around data sharing and open and fair data uh, came a little bit later. And I honestly think that one of the reasons for that is because these are extremely complex phenomena. So even like 10 times more complex than publication of papers. And um, back then I also realized that, but I also realized that um, if there is a mandate for fair data, for open data, then Daria has to put infrastructure, yes, and procedures, yes, but also support and training and accumulated knowledge in place to help um, easing the compliance for scholars whom we are serving. And um, so in 2020, we started um, a working group for research data management. Mm -hmm. uh, in the humanities, uh, because we wanted to have um, consolidate. We saw that, you know, there are lots of discussions on the EU level about research data management and support and how to do that right and how to write a data management plan and things like this. But our impression was that the generic discipline agnostic discussions around these topics will, necessary, will not necessarily serve well the humanists. Not, on, not, not because they're so special or not because, because humanities is the white child of disciplines. There is no such thing, but um, certain specificities that we already discussed, like being exposed to cultural heritage data and the like has to be taken into account. So, we wanted to bring together experience and consolidate experience from different disciplines. So we have disciplinary champions in this working group whom we know, who we trust, who are doing an epic good work as scholars. They are not open science advocates, they are real researchers, you know, like tenured or early career or um, in different situations. But what is common in them is that they are doing really good job with working along sharing the resources, working with sharing in mind. And later we also see that um, in addition to them, in addition to this disciplinary champions or representatives, um, there is a new type of professional role emerging across Europe who I would call data support professionals. Mm -hmm. um, they are sometimes called data stewards or open science officers, or here in Germany, in many cases, they are called subject librarians because they are indeed uh, librarians by, by training. And what is common in them is that they're having brand new professional roles of supporting scholars in um, research data management. And um, 
we were also like we we realized at training events organized by Daria around open humanities and open data and fair data is that there is a need for such professionals who are working in in domain specific humanities specific contexts to meet each other and to exchange experience because everything is is um, uh, is really new uh, in their in in these professional roles the institutions the mandates that are changing a lot um, establishing these uh, these these uh, support institutions so we use this working group also to for for them to to meet and network and uh, exchange and consolidate good practices and I'm super excited that we are going to have our first writing sprint in June this year in Warsaw. And that's gonna be the first time that we oh, meet each other with the group, members of the group face-to-face. -face. <laughs> that's so nice. Okay. So you mentioned um, the event is gonna be in Warsaw and Daria is serving 20, how many countries? 20 yeah, tw 20 countries and um, a couple of uh, cooperation, cooperating partners who are not full members, but in terms of members, we have 20 countries and one observer member who is Switzerland. So what's your experience in terms of how can open science bring Europe together? Also, like, because what's visible in databases is mostly English literature. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of manuscripts and also um, the high capacity, I would suggest um, research institutions produce just more in numbers because they have more resources to produce stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. research, scholarly output. Um, so how is Open Science helping to bring about visibility also to Eastern, Southern Europe, so mm -hmm. to both? Um, Eastern and Southern European countries or the smaller countries which are actually bigger in size in Scandinavia, many of which. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how, how does open science serve cultural diversity in terms of scholarly mm -hmm. culture and cultural mm -hmm. heritage and perhaps also then towards multilingualism? But these are basically two or three questions. So yes. first of all, the first question would be before we come to talk about multilingualism, is is Eastern Europe now for you also being Hungarian by mm -hmm. origin or being by identity, cultural identity? Um, do you see Eastern Europe now better represented in the scholarly system than before the boost and or the the move towards open science, or is are we still struggling to see diversity? That's a very, very complex question. And I would also add a very spot on one. Yes. Um, I think uh, we can come back to this basic principle that I keep repeating that, like, you know, one of the biggest challenges in implementing open science, I'm talking about practices, but I'm talking about policies as well, because Daria is also involved, like Daria is representing arts and humanities in policy conversations, European policy conversations about um, the future of research funding, the future of open science, the future of fed data. And what is really difficult is to avoid or resist these simplistic blanket solutions and still find a kind of a functional common ground that is uh, more or less working uh, or flexible enough to make it work in this very different, very diverse disciplinary environment, but also very diverse geographical environment. And we can see this at Daria very, very clearly when uh, we have a look at the diversity within the national Darias. And for Daria, it's, it's structurally important. We will never became an organized, strong top-down organized institution because we are aware that um, arts and humanities research itself is very much embedded in local scales, in local languages, in yeah. local uh, contexts. And therefore, um, we need to keep, the, we do want to keep this diversity, which comes with a kind of a sort of an autonomy. But um, when it comes to open science, you know, um, 
part of my job at Daria is to provide open science trainings, online training, offline training um, around topics that are requested by the Daria member institutions. And I have to confess that these are very, very different conversations mm -hmm. about open science. There is on the one hand, um, the degree of awareness and I come back to Tony's paper on uh, um, open science done wrong can fuel uh, or conservate existing power structures mm -hmm. in academia. I see this in many cases, uh, researchers coming from Germany, coming from Denmark, coming from Switzerland, uh, for them, open science, open access in many cases, no brainer because they already have um, funder mandates who come with, that come with strong uh, open access publication imperatives. But even more importantly to that, more importantly to that, they come with institutional resources to make those open access, open science mandates happen. So they have the policies, they have the knowledge, they have the resources in many cases, but uh, still we shouldn't think that um, diversity is only limited to Eastern, Western or Southern, Northern angles, because what I routinely observe in my daily job is that for instance, what works for France, that open science strategy that works for France will never ever work in Germany because one country is strongly centralized. The other one is the opposite. It's a federation of, of regions, autonomous regions. So it also has its impact on how infrastructures are connected, how standards are negotiated. Oh, how wow. I never thought on that level. Thanks for yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But but speaking of probably the 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 yeah the the, the variable that that uh, I'm the most sensitive towards you are right as a Hungarian scholar is is the eastern western ones so we are having very um, different conversations and um, what I really love in 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 the composition of Daria is that uh, it's relatively balanced uh, in terms of membership. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, like uh, I really love working together. For instance, my Polish colleagues, uh, Marta, Marta Blasnitska, who is my co-chair at my um, at my research data management working group, our research data management working group, and Maciej Maria, um, and um, and one of the shared barriers that we repeatedly overcome. And this will take us to the to, to need to overcome, and this will take us to to the issue of multilingualness. As um, you know, we need to be aware of certain disparities when it comes to digitization, when it comes to resources uh, to digitize resources to to upscale languages, and um, there is a strong bias, you know, towards what is uh, digitally openly available, and we need to keep in mind that institutions uh, across Europe have varying capacities to invest into that. So we are talking about serious disparities when it comes to open access to data, when it comes to upscaling tools, for instance, NLP tools to I would say uh, lesser resourced languages. So it's part of our collective mission at Daria, but also beyond Daria, when it comes to digital infrastructures to raise awareness of such disparities. Mm -hmm. And even if we won't have capacity to digitize everything, at least on the metadata level, I would say uh, we should put all these digital invisible resources to a map of uh, still digital, they just, just pin them on the, even if we cannot bring the content itself uh, fully digital, fully available for computational analysis, we need to just pin them down, like making aware of others that there is stuff there sitting in cultural heritage institutions. Mm -hmm. And another, so in this respect, so there is a huge 
bias towards uh, English language and and uh, and uh, global topics and the like. And uh, I think we are or going to what's supposedly global, but often very much yes. Western, yes. And Northern American, Central Western European. Yes, absolutely, mm. absolutely, and and. Uh, you know, it takes us to the to the issue of um, research rewards. So, but before discussing multilingualism in the context of publications, I also want to highlight the problem manifesting itself probably even even more stronger um, on the level of. Um, content and procedures that are beyond the research paper. So uh, just to tell you an example, there is a very um, exciting initiative that Daria is in, Daria, in which Daria is collaborating with um, Princeton University. And it's about um, training humanities scholars in the development of natural language processing tools mm -hmm. to optimize them for lesser resource languages. So to, to, to compensate this kind of disparities in terms of digitization that I mentioned to you, because um, most of these text analysis tools who are, by the way, making wonder and, and really can be really wonderful contributions uh, from humanists to the broader scientific public, um, they are trained on data, they are trained on training corpora available in English, right? Mm -hmm or French, yeah, good, Spanish in many cases, um, but how about Hungarian, yes, how about um, certain Chinese dialects, how about classic Arabic, how about Yoruba, how about African languages? Yeah. So um, we have this collaboration with, with, with Princeton, or my colleagues I have, um, especially uh, Tomat Tashawacz, uh, one of the directors of, uh, of Doria, and they are doing, um, incredibly valuable, but super difficult to work in upscaling and optimizing these NLP tools for particular uh, lesser resource languages or language varieties. And this is something, this is such a merciless task, I would say, because if you think about it, um, people, the researchers who are working in this collaboration um, I think most of them in their institutions are rewarded for writing books, writing research papers, teaching, uh, attracting research grants, but by no means working on uh, or upscaling NLP pipelines. This is completely uh -huh. out of the site for research evaluation, I would say. Yeah, it's, or it's lovely to hear about this initiative um, still. And with Africa Archive, we have a similar one, similar yet different. So we're not, um, but we're also digitizing with an organization called Masakane, which is a pan-African uh, data science multilingual um, language, pro NLP, well, also language mm -hmm. processing organization. The thing is, as you pointed out, like most, there's there's around 2,500 recognized African languages on the continent, mm -hmm. probably more, whatever is considered recognized. Um, and then dialects of all kinds. Um, and our project is to uh, translate English articles written by African scholars uh, into African languages and not the ones that are already pretty well covered by machine translation, like Google Translate, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. others. Um, but those that we're actually building a corpus of terms, um, scientific terms across disciplines. So we've, we've um, categorized um, the disciplines that we want to cover the, a certain level of, um, of understanding for undergraduate um, scholars also, mm -hmm. um, to, to also make, like not to have it too nerdy, <laughs> basically <laughs> not too nerdy science, but that some, that research output that's still comprehensible by normal people. <laughs> and then translating <laughs> that into regional and local languages. Um, 
and and these are also still big languages but the coverage in digital form is pretty much non-existent and many african languages are also historically on the oral so there's not much um written mm -hmm. um, <laughs> archives on it or studies um yeah all of the languages but so basically the idea is to enrich the african languages with these now and many in many cases new scientific terms and thereby fostering the use of african languages also for science communication so that's the idea so we're addressing several layers of decolonization or colonial heritage if you want mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also called decolonized science, and it's much harder than we we thought it would be difficult, but it's actually more difficult. <laughs> so first, we we were hopeful that we would just translate the articles as they are. Turns out it's too too tricky, too many details, too many kind of specific terms. So we're now creating lay summaries. And when I say we, that's actually science. Um, so we are. We're working with Renafic Archive, Marcasana Science Link, which is a science, uh, South African um, science literacy organization, um, or the science journalists. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also SC Communications, which is, uh, they are specialized in, in translation of Africa, uh, into African languages. And vice versa. So it's a beautiful project. And I feel that we should also talk off record more about maybe how we can bring <laughs> those initiatives together or um, because there might be some room for interactions and um, co cooperation, maybe in the future or as they're ongoing. Exciting. OK, so so basically addressing the like as we as we raise awareness about the need for cultural specificity and multilingualism the importance of language when it comes to research like my argument i at some point it struck me when i realized whatever discipline you're studying if we are being forced to only use english and even for our native english speakers technical english that's often assumed to like that, that some many scholars nowadays assume we have to use a technical English that sounds really scientific. But no, because that's when we strip off the cultural context of the exactly. And also exactly. in the main subjects, like I feel everything, like knowledge comes with culture and cultural experience. And if we only use technical language, then we, we might look at facts, but they are of no use, really unless we contextualize them also culturally and especially also in where I come from biosciences and ecology like what's the point in talking about ecosystems and endangered species and, and all of that if you don't use terms that are culturally kind of coined also and that makes sense for the very local ecosystem so what i'm trying to say here i think it's important that researchers are allowed to conduct research in their own language and yes we also need a lingua franca we actually do have multilingual francas currently and there's only talks about an hour. Well, maybe I'm in a very big bubble here, and another re word region says talks about Spanish, but there's different realities in different places of the earth. But but we assume that the lingua franca being English, and that might be the major bulk of the research output, but it's certainly not the only bulk of the research output. So there's more bugs in Mandarin and Spanish, Portuguese, and then various so a lot of the local research across Africa is being produced and disseminated in African languages and it's never being picked up by any Western database. So yes, how can that's we assume, the... sorry, I just wanted to finish this. How can we assume <laughs> that all we see in Google Scholar or wherever whatever um aggregator we look at is what we know about the world it's not we know much more and i mean you beautifully um pointed that out previously so yeah how so let shall we create because we had several conversations about multilingualism also in the past mm -hmm. um shall we create a vision for 
how we how we see a multilingual multilingual scholarly system in very soon, like two five years from now. How will a perfect multilingually inclusive, globally connected scholarly communication system look like? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a beautiful question, uh, Joe. Thanks for that. Uh, what is clear to me is that it's necessarily a decentralized one and a multi-layered one by which I mean that, um, as you mentioned, um, there are serious infrastructural prerequisites of that. Like uh, there is this important studies by my, again, my a Polish colleague of mine, uh, Emanuel Kulczycki, who shows that uh, how much um, Eastern European countries and, and other countries as well, uh, how much native locally relevant um, local uh, like publications in local languages are not indexed in international databases like okay. Web of Science or Scopus. So there are serious infrastructural prerequisites to that and infrastructures like the Arian system infrastructures like operas are doing very, very important work in this respect to, to expand the inclusiveness of uh, the scholarly information management uh, systems and discovery environments. So this is one thing, but that's about infrastructure that metadata standards are talking to each other and um, the information management systems are talking to each other in multiple languages. And that's of course investment, but uh, money well spent, I would say. Mm -hmm. But there is also this, um, in addition to the infrastructural layer, there is also the social layer, right? So we still have a lot of work to do with the anecdotal reviewer too, who says, uh, makes comments like, I suggest this should be revised by a native English speaker, you know, because the language register of the publication is not formal enough. So um, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole I, I, discussion topic on its own. Yes, yes. Or maybe yes, not, I, like, let's not discuss about that. <laughs> Let's not, let's not even get into this dark and windy road, but so that's, that's the social layer also. Um, I hear a lot from colleagues, from, from uh, scholars I'm working together is that if they work with, um, if they work with their locally uh, relevant topics, local data and local languages, within Europe, so I'm not, I'm not talking about big cross-cultural, you know, investigations here, uh, data from the Czech Republic, data from Poland, data from Hungary, in many cases they need to, they feel the need that they need to justify in publications why this is of relevant uh, by contrast to working their American or English equivalent. So that's also, so the social cultural layer of, of this is something to be changed for the better. Mm. And in the middle or on top of the social and infrastructural components to fix, uh, I would also add the dimension of, again, of recognitions and research reports. So as long as we are rewarded along bibliometrics, along citation counts and the like, I think it remain almost inevitable that research will be skewed or even distorted towards the big topics, towards the big languages, towards the big publishers. Um, so of course, for a Hungarian scholar to publish something good quality in English, this is of this, th that's a lot of added effort and, and knowledge and, and value, but how about uh, multilingual publications? How about the effort of translating back, bringing knowledge back to mm -hmm. your local communities who raised you as a scholar? So I think there is a hell lot of work to do on the level of policies, on the level of research assessment as well, because currently multilingualism seems to be quite an overlooked dimension. Yeah. And also liberating funds, I think, which would come through the policy change. Because um, mm -hmm. it is, I mean, there's a whole profession, uh, translators and interpreters. 
which are needed and we they also need it's basically like science journalism we need translators who have a certain understanding or at least interest in scientific topics of any kind mm -hmm. so to make sure that they capture the research aspects also not just in translating words mm -hmm. but actually having an understanding of what's being written about and also from the scientists to make an effort to keep their work and output comprehensible there's nothing fancy about using technical terms or overly technical lingo <laughs> it just makes everybody lives more difficult <laughs> so, <laughs> also what i preach in my scientific writing courses um, <laughs> yeah uh, yeah that's that's a really a beautiful vision to have also a lot of work still but yes. I, I think we're in a good way we can really do this to to provide for culturally sensitive and inclusive multilingual scholarly communication that is totally possible and we know where to tighten the screws where to add some more wood where to plant new trees <laughs> i started the wood um, paraphrasing, so I wanted to come back to an ecologically sustainable paraf um, yeah, image as well. <laughs> but yeah, so, so it's totally doable. There's a lot of work underway already to, to make scholarly, co co scholarly communication properly globally inclusive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and it's, yeah, we, we'll keep pushing. So so yeah, some final remarks just to have a, a roundup for this episode. And let me just say thanks also so much for spending the time and, and sharing all your wisdom with us and some insights into the, the highly important, highly needed and also highly rewarding, I assume, work that you do. It is rewarding for sure. And um, and. You know, in many cases, uh, like there are times where I just realized when it comes to, you know, there is this common uh, political idea that how oh, we are operating in our own bubbles and the like. Um, I think this is a super important future priority for open science support people, for advocates to break out of our own bubbles from time to time to really reach uh, the realities, to, to reach the actual practitioners, the actual scholars who are uh, having a busy life, who are published or perish, who are having families, who are uh, maneuvering their way to, to tenure and institutional realities and funding and the next career move and staying in academia and leaving academia. Uh -huh. So. Uh, this really happens when, when like, the, what I'm trying to say is that I feel incredibly lucky having the, for having the chance to, to work on these things, trying to be useful uh, for them. But on the other end, and this necessarily implies leaving the comfort zone bubbles for them as well, for us as well. But I'm also super grateful for all the efforts that we mentioned already, all the fellow colleagues, all the fellow mm -hmm. dreamers um, who are fight, who are indeed meaningfully fighting for a more inclusive and, and, and multilingual uh, scholarly ecosystem, I would say, and they are doing the works, they're doing the right things and doing things right i think so uh, i'm super grateful for for forming intellectual collegial communities mm. with them and in, of course including you as well Jim. so thanks a lot for, <laughs> for for sharing your insights from time to time you know mm. yeah we learn and grow with each other and mm. and this is also what i love about this podcast format in the, the format to have a conversation to vision to, to create visions and to dream a little bit and then see what's mm -hmm. possible and yeah just to to keep keep moving and keep building a better world like 
Yeah, I think we are now also in, in, we, we have responsibilities to leave the world really a better place. Previous generations, I'm not saying they messed up, but they, they were kind of okay, but now we're not okay in this world for many, or okay-ish. <laughs> but also I believe that research and science and, and interdisciplinary exchange and conversations like these ones can really allow us to utilize research output to, to solve most, if not all, of the issues that we're currently um, experiencing. Um, and the world will always struggle. There's also the fight for survival in nature. It's always been, will always be. But just to sustain a livelihood for, I don't know, like I'm a biologist, so I'm looking at it from that way, but also now with in times of war, Ukraine, Russia being isolated, there's many other countries who are conflict ridden. I think we can we we as humans we know better and we can do better and we will do better. So um okay. I was trying to end on a positive note, I'm not sure if I was able to, <laughs> but <laughs> hope, yeah, hopeful. Let's be hopeful and we know we're doing the right thing and um and it's it's great to see others are on the same and very similar journeys. And as long as we keep talking to each other, I think there is also good reason for hope and, and progress. Yes, yes, it has to do a lot. I think in a small scale, it's easy to imagine like this whole open access thing, open science thing is opening up these bigger, smaller black boxes, mm -hmm. you know, like opening windows on and research processes opening windows on what's going opening windows on power relations as well and i think that the podcast format is a really good and pleasant opportunity to open windows on not necessarily black boxes but boxes that one would not necessarily have at hand so thanks a lot for for having me and and uh, and boxing with me a little bit. <laughs> great pleasure <laughs> So yeah, see you soon again. Let's also see in the real world. I first live in Berlin mm -hmm. and spring is coming. So let's go for hopefully. <laughs> <coffee>. <laughs> Thank you, Angela.